Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I lost my left leg in an accident when I was 18 years old. It took a long time to adjust to life as an amputee, but eventually I got pretty comfortable wearing my prosthetic leg. It gave me back a lot of mobility and independence. Of course, there are still challenges. Simple things like going shopping can be really tiring and painful without designated handicap parking spots close to the store entrance, so I always make sure to hang my valid handicap parking permit on the rearview mirror before heading out. Last weekend, I went to the grocery store like usual. As I pulled into the lot, I spotted an open handicap spot right by the entrance, which was super lucky. I carefully parked my car and got out, leaning on my cane for support. But when I glanced over at the car next to me, my heart sank. Sitting in the driver's seat was a middle-aged woman who looked perfectly healthy and able-bodied. No handicap tag or placard was visible in her car. It really bothered me to see someone blatantly misusing a spot meant for disabled folks like myself. I debated saying something, but figured it wasn't worth starting an argument. With a sigh, I slowly made my way towards the store entrance, but I had only taken a few steps when I heard a shrill voice yell out, Excuse me, what do you think you're doing? I turned to see the woman marching toward me, an indignant scowl on her face. Before I could respond, she jabbed a finger towards my car and snapped, You're parked in my spot. I always park there when I shop. How dare you take my spot? I stared at her in disbelief. I'm sorry, I didn't realize this was your personal reserved parking space, I said evenly. I parked here because I'm disabled and have a permit. You don't appear to be handicapped or have any permit displayed. The woman flushed an angry red. How I look doesn't matter, she sputtered. This is my spot. I claimed it. Now you need to move your car and find somewhere else to park. Now I was really furious. Ma'am, this is a designated handicap spot, not your own personal parking space, I retorted. You can't just claim a handicap spot when you don't even need it. That's illegal. The woman stepped threateningly towards me. Don't you dare lecture me, she shouted. I'm reporting you for harassment. Now get your car out of my spot before I call the police. Before I could respond, she suddenly lunged forward and grabbed my prosthetic leg through my pants. I lost my balance and toppled over onto the pavement. The woman tried yanking my prosthesis right off, clearly intending to steal it. What are you doing? I yelled in shock. Give me back my leg! We grappled awkwardly on the ground as I tried prying her hands off my prosthesis. Just then, a man came rushing over from the store. Hey! Knock it off! He shouted at the woman. She finally released her grip on my leg and I scooted away from her, shaken and outraged. The man helped me to my feet and retrieved my cane for me. What happened here? He asked gently. I quickly explained how the able-bodied woman had occupied a handicap spot illegally. When I called her out on it, she became enraged and literally tried to detach my prosthetic leg. Is this true, ma'am? The man asked with a frown. The woman just glared sullenly without responding. The man shook his head in disgust. You should be ashamed of yourself, he told her angrily, attacking and trying to steal from a disabled person just because you wrongly think a handicap spot belongs to you? The woman still refused to speak, but her face burned in fury and humiliation at being caught. I'm the store manager, the man informed us. I apologize sincerely for how you were treated, sir. And you... He narrowed his eyes at the woman. You are banned from this grocery store for your appalling behavior. Now I suggest you get in your car and leave immediately before I call the police. The woman looked like she wanted to keep arguing, but under the manager's stern gaze, she stomped back to her car. As she started the engine, the manager gently grasped my arm. Let me walk with you inside where you can sit down, he said kindly. I'll bring you some water while you recover from that ordeal. I thanked him sincerely. As we walked past the woman's car, I paused and turned towards her open window. Next time, think twice before wrongly claiming spaces meant for disabled folks, I told her. You never know if the person you're harassing may turn out to be an amputee. Leaving her gaping speechlessly, I continued on into the store with the manager. While the experience shook me up, it felt good to stand up for myself against that entitled woman's outrageous behavior. I hope she learned an important lesson that day about respecting handicapped parking spaces. The next one is a pro-revenge story. This happened around 20 years ago. Our family owned two apartment buildings, each with three units. We lived in two of them and rented out the other four. There were nothing but these three flats lining both sides of the road for about a mile. Not all had parking. On the side streets were houses and very little street parking. We had more land than most of these units, since it was also our home. So we had parking for around 16 cars. 
Everything was fine for literally decades. Then cars started appearing in our parking lot that were not our tenants. I blocked one in one day. Went outside to see this a-hole drove through our bushes and across the yard to get out. I called the cops, nothing they could do. So I called a tow company and had them put up signs. We would have to call them to have a car towed. The signs seemed to work. No more random cars. Until New Year's Eve one year. I arrived home and every space was filled. There were even cars on the street blocking in the other cars. I was beyond pissed. I called the tow company. They couldn't do anything for a few hours because they were so busy. We were in the Chicago suburbs. It was below zero out. I had an idea. I dug out the lawn sprinklers and hoses. I ran one hose inside to the laundry room faucet and turned on the hot water. This way the hose and sprinklers wouldn't ice up. But the cars and ground sure did. Three sprinklers moved every half hour or so for almost five hours. Every car, every square inch of the parking lot, the street by the cars, encased in ice. I made it a point to spray ice in the locks between the window seals and glass, in the grills. I put away the sprinklers and hoses, went to bed. At 4 a.m. there was furious pounding on the doors, doorbells ringing nonstop. We just smiled and called the cops, waited until they arrived and went outside. The cops were holding back laughter. These people were told to park here by their friend, who owned an apartment several buildings away. The same idiot who drove over our bushes. I pointed to the tow sign and told the people to move their cars or get towed. In our town, cops can ticket on private property with the owner's permission. So all cars were ticketed. They were also towed since nobody could get in their vehicle. Wish we had it on video. The next one is a petty revenge story. Something I, 28F, witnessed last night at the supermarket. I am way too much of a coward to do anything like this myself. I was in the condiment aisle picking out salad dressing. There was another girl, looked around my age, reading the back of mustard packages, I'm assuming, looking at the ingredients. In comes another woman, 40-ish, on a scooter. I don't want to contribute to stereotypes, but this was a rather large person and very cliche of the particular large chain supermarket I was in. She stopped her cart for 20-ish seconds, probably 10 feet from Mustard Lady. I didn't think anything of it. Mustard Lady was barely 5 feet and maybe 100 pounds, standing close to the shelves. She had a basket close beside her that I think took up more space than her. Suddenly Scooter charged forward, swerving a bit closer to the shelves, looking right at Mustard. Admittedly, I had chosen that moment to try to peek at Mustard Lady's basket. I'm chronically curious. So I caught the whole thing. With a yelp and rather impressive back jump, Mustard Lady dodged the Scooter, but her basket was toppled over, knocking several things out. Scooter Lady kept her head forward and made no acknowledgement. Before I could even decide if I had the social fortitude to offer to help, Mustard Lady scooped up her goods and basket, caught up with the scooter, and grabbed what looked like a box of pasta from the scooter's basket. She then walked across the aisle and made to put the pasta box on the top shelf where Scooter Lady couldn't reach. Scooter Lady screeched, What the hell? Mustard Lady responded with a deadpan, Oh, so you can see me. I don't remember the exact phrasing because I get petrified of even secondhand conflict, and it was so absurd. But Scooter Lady gave a short rant about Mustard Lady being in the way, and needing to pay more attention to her surroundings. I think Scooter Lady thought Mustard Lady was on her phone, her large, yellow, French's brand phone. I don't think Mustard Lady actually intended on placing the pasta box up on the shelves because she had been just sort of holding it up. However, when Scooter Lady's self-righteous speech was over, Mustard Lady didn't say another word. From what I could see out of the corner of my eye, she didn't even look mad. Mustard Lady just looked right at Scooter Lady and tossed the box onto an upper shelf and walked away, though she did walk the long way behind the scooter I think to avoid being run over again. I had been pretending to choose between some vinaigrettes, but tossed the closest one in my cart and slipped quickly away lest I become the next hit-and-run victim. Fortunately, the salad dressing was very close to the end of the aisle. I can only imagine that was a situation where Mustard Lady will think of and regret not having some sort of comeback. But that silent pasta toss was absolute gold. I didn't see either of them again, but the pasta box was still there when I walked past the aisle on my way out. Not the most interesting story, but in my very boring, social anxiety-filled life, it was quite an event. The next one is a malicious compliance story. Okay, working with the public is always a fun time. I truly believe everyone should have to deal with a Karen with a forced smile. It's a great lesson in tolerance and learning the limits of them. Now, I, at the time, have been a chef for about eight years. I've built up a good, thick skin at this point, so I can deal with the different breed of Karen, 
you'd however see in my work environment, a tourist hotspot near the ocean. Learning to deal with the unicorn of Karens, the entitled vacationing Mega Karen, VMK for short. Some of my co-workers, namely the younger summer job wait staff, haven't developed the methods of tolerance yet. So with that lined up, let me get to the story. I was the sous chef of an outdoor terrace-style seafood restaurant by the sea that was also a seaside inn. On this day, a party of five came in, VMK with four others. I want to say friends. The entire time I could hear her complain that the waitress was slow with service. Everything was taking too long. We had a full house at the time. Anyway, after chowder bread and a shared appetizer, all of which, according to VMK, took forever to get to the table, it was time to order salads. Now, it's at this point I can tell she has been there before because she ordered the Caesar salad, but made a point to say hold the anchovies because she was allergic. No, at this point I should say that we serve our Caesar salad with two anchovies in an X on top of our dish. Now, she had said this in such a harsh way that my little waitress was about in tears, and VMK seemed to be enjoying it. Her friends seemed to be used to her type of behavior. So it was here I decided to step in. I walked over in my bright white chef coat with the tall paper chef's hat and spoke to Karen. I'm sorry I couldn't help over here. Please let me personally handle your order. We take allergies very seriously. I will be out with your order in a few minutes. So I then stepped inside. Our salad station was indoors. I asked our salad chef to make a Caesar salad without dressing or garnish, the anchovies. While I stepped inside the storage room and took the label off the box, our dressing came in. Three minutes after I stepped inside, I came back out and placed a plate of romaine lettuce with Parmesan cheese and croutons. At first, VMK had that smug, victorious look on her face. That lasted about 30 seconds till she realized loudly, Where the heck is my dressing? I asked for a Caesar salad! I, equally as loud but calm, my voice carries like that, said, But ma'am, you are allergic. I can't feed you something you are allergic to. She yelled, pointing her finger at me. I said I'm allergic to anchovies. I had your salad yesterday, and you put anchovies on it. I just want my salad without anchovies. Now go make me one without it. I said, but ma'am, it's right there in front of you. I have made you an anchovy-free salad. But from what you have just told me, I have good news for you. But let me confirm that you had my salad yesterday. Yes, I just removed the portion that had the anchovies on it. It's at this point I realized I had the attention of the whole front end. Aha, I said. Well, I have good news and bad news for you. The good news is that you are not allergic to anchovies. And the bad news is that I know this because you ate some yesterday and are still fine. Putting my hand up to stop her protests, I said, not as loudly but firmly. Anchovies are one of the main ingredients in Caesar salad dressing. Reaching inside my pocket and pulling out the label, I pointed to the second ingredient, anchovy paste. To this day, I can close my eyes and see her go from red to white and back again. Her friends almost fell out of their chairs laughing. I got a chuckle from a few other tables too. My little waitress got one hell of a tip from that table. Likely not from Karen, but her friends. The next one is an entitled people story. So I have this family member who seems to think everyone owes her because... Family. She moved here with her husband and kids to be close to their parents, and proceeded to get butt hurt because their parents didn't devote all their time to her and her kids, and worse still, didn't spend all their money showering the kids with gifts. My husband and I have recently built a house, and it was finally finished in time for us to move in before Christmas. I have a lot of children, some are adults, and have moved out of the family home. The only thing I wanted for Christmas was to spend our first Christmas in our new home with all of our children together for the first time in years. They always come and visit around this time of year, but with spouses, work, and other obligations, we haven't been all together at the same time for years, and especially not on Christmas Day. But this year my wish was granted, and I was Buddy the Elf, excited for Christmas this year. Last Christmas, entitled family member fed me a sob story about how they have no one and Christmas will be just horrible, so I told her they could join us if they wanted to, which they did. They proceeded to drink all the cocktails within minutes, just slamming them down one after the other, sat around complaining about the heat, complaining about other family members, ate, then left. I didn't really mind. If I'm honest, I had a migraine and was cooking in 40 degree C heat, so I didn't really have the capacity to care. I'd been talking about my plans for Christmas this year for months, moving into the house and having all my kids home. Entitled family member had plans of their own. They were all heading out of town and visiting other family members over Christmas. All is well. No issues, no problems. Well, if that were the case, I wouldn't be here now, would I? 
Christmas Day rolls around, and as planned, I had all my kids home, all the adult kids' significant others. It was a fantastic day. After Christmas dinner, I got a text message saying we're no longer family. Obviously, I reply with WTF and get a response saying we're not family anymore. She's done. Insert threats of self-harm and hopes I have an amazing life. I had absolutely no idea where all this was coming from, but I guess in the warped mindset that is entitlement, it all made sense to her. After a lot of back and forth trying to figure out what the problem was, it turns out their Christmas plans fell through, and they had to come home before Christmas. Apparently, I'm a massive AH because I don't spend all my time stalking people on social media, and therefore didn't know they had returned home. I'm an even bigger AH because I didn't invite them to my house for Christmas Day. I'd been very clear in the lead-up to Christmas, I know the entitlement runs deep with this one, and had said multiple times this Christmas was the first Christmas in my new home and was being spent with all my children. No one else, no extended family, no friends. Just me, hubby, our kids, and partners. At one point after asking what the problem was and getting no closer to an answer, I came straight out and said, Is this all really over the fact I spent this Christmas with my kids and didn't invite you and your family this year? Turns out that's exactly what the problem was. They'd had to come back home for whatever reason. She's ostracized herself and her family from the rest of the extended family, so they spent their Christmas in their own home with just her hubby and kids while I was making the most of my day with my hubby and my kids. And it hurt her feelings that my adult children had their long-term partners here as well. Apparently my kids' partners aren't family because being in serious monogamous relationships for years means nothing, and she's blood so she should have been invited. Am I missing something here? Where in the rule book of family does it say I have to invite every man and his dog to my home for every special occasion? Where does it say everyone else's happiness is my responsibility? How do seemingly normal people build a mindset of the whole world owes me? The next one is an entitled parent story. I am confused, and I want to do a good job raising my daughter, and I want to be a good mom. She will be 17 in just a couple of weeks, and she only once ever had a job at McDonald's when she was 14. We forced her to have that job. I don't know what is going on inside of her head, but my sense is that she resented it at the time and resents it still. It's hard because we are well off as a family financially, blessing, but only because her father and I are self-made. We both pulled ourselves out of poverty, escaped homes with addiction and neglect, paid for our own education, found each other, and scrimped and saved and went without for so long. We went without so many things so we could invest money and buy property. We ate beans and drove a car with no reverse. No joke. My husband had to push it out of parking spaces while I steered, and this was when I was eight months pregnant. The problem is we obviously are trying to give our kids what we never had. Our son, who is 18, is a very hard worker, and he is not afraid of hard work or hustle. But our daughter, I don't know how to say it, I guess she just doesn't pull her weight. It doesn't feel like she pulls her weight around the house. She does well in school, and she plays varsity lacrosse. For this, I'm very proud of her. I feel so far away from her, though, and I cannot relate to her because she doesn't want to work or do anything for herself financially. She always asks us for money. We pay for her car, her car insurance, her gas, her phone plan, her health insurance, obviously since she's on our health insurance, and we send her to lacrosse camps and pay for her sport. We buy her clothes, essentials only, nothing fancy, etc. We put food on the table and we have a safe home. At the moment, our approach is, if you don't want to work, then you need to learn how to live poor. There's nothing wrong with that. My husband and I lived poor for many years, and we were very happy. But if she doesn't want to work, then she can't have the extras. She wants to get her hair done. And I told her no, because it's too expensive to get highlights. She always wants her nails done, and I always tell her no. You have to get nail polish from Walgreens, and do it yourself, etc., etc. The thing is, I don't want her growing up feeling like money is a weapon. We are not withholding stuff from her to be nasty, but it's not realistic for her to expect people to pay for her lifestyle her whole life. The trouble comes in when I know, as a 17-year-old female, she's doing battle right now to get on her feet, feel good about herself, and figure out who she is. So I want to support that and be compassionate. I want to help her be strong and independent. The reason I'm writing in this thread is that I'm sure there are a lot of young people here who feel unfairly treated by their parents. I would like your advice on how I can bridge this gap between my daughter and me in a way that supports her, but also holds her accountable for her own decisions. How do I do that? I'm scared that all she is going to remember 
is how we had the money to give her things and do things for her, but we didn't. And she will equate that with, she's not worth it. But this isn't true. But I don't want that to become her narrative, and her story that she tells herself as she fosters more and more resentment against us, and me in particular. What should I do? Update. Thank you to everyone who commented. I truly appreciate it. There are a mix of comments in here. To those of you who basically said she's just a kid, or she's a minor, or since I had poverty trauma, why should I make her suffer? Well, she is one year from being considered a legal adult. So there's that. I would like to get her to a place where she's adulting at the level of a 17-year-old. Working one four eight-hour shift on a Sunday doesn't seem too outlandish to me. However, I did read your comments, and I'm taking them on board, as I try to understand all the different viewpoints. Thank you. To those of you who commented, give her an allowance and teach her budgeting. I will try some of your pointers. This seems to be going in the right direction. Maybe it's a good compromise. She's not exactly earning her own money, or learning the important life skills of having a job, that you don't always love but have to be responsible enough to do. But it could teach her budgeting. Thank you, you have given me lots of good ideas. To those of you who throw hate at me for raising her to be an entitled rich girl, maybe you can get in the ring against the folks that hate me for forcing her to live poor. Haha, ha, I must be amazing to simultaneously create two polar opposite, mutually exclusive existences for her. But this is Reddit after all. And actually, seriously, thank you for commenting. I was worried about not thinking about the situation from every angle, but I feel like the comments here really do come from every angle. And that is truly what I wanted and why I posted. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.